next talk is uh, data exploitation will be presented by Privacy International. We will have three speakers, uh, leading with uh, Christopher Weatherhead. Yeah, a big applause for him. <laughs> then, our next speaker is Erin Leverett, and we will have a third mystery speaker that will get introduced within the talk. <laughs> So about Privacy International, you are famous for suing GC yep, HQ tough. and winning. So you have which is rare. <laughs> These things happen. Which is rare. So we have, I leave you with this wonderful speakers yes. and a big applause for them. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. Oh, I just lost my microphone. No, yeah, cool. your I'm still going. Cool. Welcome, all yeah. genders. Yeah, welcome. Just from a, a quick bit of audience participation, how many of you actually heard of Privacy International? But, uh, All right. Uh, so Good. we're like an eighth. Yeah. That's not, not bad. too bad. That's, so I'd just like to introduce this as uh, the esteemed Aaron Leverett. Thank I'm you. Christopher Weatherhead. I've been working for PI for about three years, nearly, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about one of our key programmatic areas, which is data exploitation. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll take you through what we're going to talk about. So mm. if you want to... We can introduce ourselves a little bit more, too. Um, Chris, sure. Chris has been working on connected cars since I've known him. So uh, part of this talk is going to be, as we said, data exploitation. Part of it's going to be Internet of Things. But we want to keep it kind of broad. So this is uh, Chris's chance to show off some of his hardware reverse engineering of the connected cars. But we've also done some stuff on data privacy with connected cars. And uh, I myself have done industrial systems for sort of 10 years, and then recently have started working with Privacy International. So I was a Mozilla web fellow there. Uh, they paid for me to work with Privacy International and do work with them, uh, but not be directly part of the organization, which uh, was great for me, um, because I got to meet Chris, right? So yeah, anything, else? anything um, else you want to say about yourself? I was going to say at the end, we're going to just talk through some principles that PI is putting together. They're work in progress, so any feedback, very welcome. Yeah. Cool. Right. Let's get started. So I'm briefly going to go through who we are and how we work and a little bit about PI generally. Then I'm going to just talk about the data exploitation program in total, totality. I'm going to do a little bit about cars. It's not going to be particularly deep, but it will be maybe interesting. Hopefully you'll find it interesting. Yep. Um, We're going to do medical devices too. I'm going to talk a little too. bit about uh, <laughs> various bits of... Uh, Gmail and Romba and yes, and that stuff. And medical yes. devices, mainly. Oh, yeah, medical yeah. devices. Uh, then we're going to do the associative power of data. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the principles we're doing. And then there's some, a little bit of a, a call out for you guys because we could do with a little bit of help, hmm. mainly in the tech side of stuff. So, one of the things to say about data exploitation is it's a brand new program. And we wanted to capture um, the way that companies are using our data. Uh, theoretically, we give our consent for them to use our data, but then they sell it on to third parties, or they go bankrupt, and the data gets sold to someone else, and you have problems like Cambridge Analytica and election hacking and all these other sorts of things that start to come about. A lot of these companies are using data in aggregation, so you might be giving up your data individually, but when they fuse it with everybody else's data, you get a wildly different effect of how that data can be used um, and how much money can be made from it. Um, so we want to capture some of the issues around that and some of the advocates who we do. Um, having been more of a hacker in most of my life, I never really worked with lawyers before. I was sort of afraid of them for the reasons you would imagine. Um, but working at Privacy International, I started to see all the ways that legal advocacy and impact litigation could change things in this space. Um, so that's part of the data exploitation platform as well. Cool. Yeah. So just on the point of uh, these three points here, Space Team, Gmail, and Roomba, um, Space Team is a game that I love. I doubt many of you have heard of it, but you play it on your phone and you shout out silly instructions to each other and you try and uh, perform them at the same time. But when we were downloading the app just the other day, it asked for permissions to the contacts, to the microphone, to the, uh, to the location, and also to um, uh, screenshots. And this is ridiculous. Like Maybe the screenshots is viable, but all the rest is totally unneeded to play the game. So that's a good example of data exploitation, where you're giving up your data in a simple way, overprivileging of apps. Uh, Gmail, of course, most of you will already know that they were scanning for, for many years for keywords inside Gmails to give you better advertising, better for various values of better, in your opinion. Um, and of course, Roomba was doing the same thing, mapping people's houses by uh, you know, selling the, uh, the cleaning uh, robots. Mm -hmm. 
So we want to capture that. Not, we're not, we don't want to pick on those companies, but we want to capture that as a general issue and how the, the wider population can fight back against that. Yep. Anything else here? Uh, no, we're going to okay. the next slide. So uh, PI is split across three major like programmatic areas. Um, the one we're best known for is our stuff around surveillance, where we've taken GCHQ to court. Uh, we do litigation in the European court. We've done quite a lot in the local courts. We've done uh, uh, interventions in the States. We did an amicus brief for uh, Apple versus FBI. We've done quite a lot. Like, it's definitely where we're best known. It's mainly around um, the proliferation of surveillance technology. Um, yeah, it's, it's surveillance generally. Um, we also did done a little bit of research that falls into the next category, which is uh, building a global movement. So we have 15 partners worldwide, um, and we uh, try and get the privacy agenda on the local uh, agenda in those countries that where, that where our partners work. Most of them are in the global south, so Latin America, South America, um, Africa. Africa, and far, the India. Far East, really. Yeah. And that's very important because trying to be a global international organization with 20 people is sort of unachievable in many ways. So by working with local partners, we have a lot better idea of what's going on on the ground, both in terms of legal changes, but political changes as well. Mm -hmm. And um, some of those countries don't yet have laws protecting privacy in any way, shape, or form. So we're able to work with them to kind of advocate for those laws to be in existence uh, at an early stage. Yeah, so when we're talking a little bit later about data exploitation, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to be cognizant of the fact that although in Europe we have quite good data protection laws, in much of the world there really isn't anything. Mm. Um, and even here in Europe, we're overly focused on GDPR and personally identifiable information kind of approach, but we don't necessarily look at the mapping of houses uh, as an issue of personal privacy, right? So. And our, yeah, and our final program is uh, data exploitation, which is broadly fits into two sort of categories overarching categories. On the one side, there's what we call data in the wings, which we'll go into a little bit about in, in a minute, but it's uh, the data you can't see, the data your device has, which others can access, or it's particularly law enforcement, but you know others, others have access to and can use, but you can't see. You don't know it's there necessarily. And the other side is uh, data that's interpreted from data you have given that you weren't expecting to be done, like um, Algorithm learning, machine learning algorithms, um, artificial intelligence, that sort of stuff around the data that you've given someone and they're trying to create new knowledge from, basically. And that's also a problem with data synthesis. So it's one thing when you give up w your data to one company and then again to another company, but you sort of assume that they will never be associated. But of course, there's an entire brokerage around data that goes on in the world. And when someone starts to associate your phone data with your car data, with your health data, uh, you start to get a much more invasive picture of an individual or an organization. Next one. So uh, how PI does its work, uh, as, as Aaron said, we're quite a small organization. There's only about 20 of us. And so we actually have a matrix structure. So we've got our three programming, programmatic areas. And across them, we've got a, a legal team, a, a research and investigations team that do, uh, often do research in places like the Global South. Um, on, on governments and other people who are uh, subverting surveillance. Then we've got a, uh, a communications team, an advocacy and campaigns team who do, um, you know, just generally trying to bring, raise the privacy agenda all around the world. And then we've got the tech team, which is what we are. Indeed. The, yeah. the best the team, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. clearly. I've, I've learned to respect the other, uh, the legal team and the advocacy team, too. But we have a nice internal sort of rivalry about these things, about how we get things done. And, um, and I like the way that works, personally. So, yeah. you know, the tech team will end up supporting the legal team on these amicus briefs. I personally had never filed an amicus brief before. So we'll get involved in some of the court cases that are going on around the world. So like Apple versus FBI or uh, the Playpen case. So we'll look into uh, potential ways that Tor might have been um, not necessarily compromised, but how it was uh, possible to track some of the users and um, how that warrant was probably violated uh, by you know, targeting, well, not targeting, 8,000 different computers around the world in something like uh, 60 jurisdictions. 
So we get involved with the legal team, and then they'll write up the amicus brief and send that off as advice to the judges uh, in the court case. But, the, but by having an organization structured like this, it means you get a lot of different viewpoints, you get a, a lot of different experience across all the program areas. Mm. It's rather than just being like, oh, the, the, the stuff around algorithms or whatever is entirely a tech issue. It's like, it's actually, no, it's not. It's an issue across multiple strata of the organization. And, mm. and the, uh, the other advocacy team is made up mostly of human rights activists and researchers. So they'll publish an individual report on, say, um, Tanzania or Kenya or Egypt, and they'll focus for six months on trying to uncover what's going on uh, including the sale of zero days to various government agencies around the world and this kind of stuff. So that's a bit of background. So what is data exploitation? Well, we kind of covered the uh, outsides, but the, you know, if we go, can we just go on to the next slide? Sorry, <laughs> do you want to go on the next slide? Yeah, you want to just yeah. move on? Okay. Yeah, sorry. So uh, this is an example of the data in the wings, which I was mentioning earlier. So on the, on the top, we've got the, uh, the the laptops that had the Snowden docs on from uh, The Guardian. Uh, I think my colleague <laughs> did a really good talk on this in, uh, at CCC 20, 2014, 2015, one of those. Um, anyway, it's, uh, the, when the laptops that the uh, Snowden docs were on were uh, at The Guardian, the, gu the uh, GCHQ turned up and uh, came around and destroyed a load of the chips on the board and a lot of them were like pretty benign chips. Well, we, what we thought were pretty benign chips, you know, had keyboard controllers, that kind of stuff. Um, and, but clearly, GCHQ were thinking that there was some way that classified information from those laptops that had handled Snowden's documentation is in those chips. So potentially, government knows something about uh, the stuff we're using every day that we don't. That, so it's quite, you know, that's, that's just a, like a, a single example. We can we, always just ask them. Is anyone from GCHQ in here today? Want to give us some feedback? <laughs> no? <laughs> Worth a try. On the other side, we've got the, uh, the field test mode of, um, on an iPhone, which allows you to see the data around all of the uh, 3G or 4G towers, you know, the cellular data. Um, the, and again, if you know the code, you can get the information, but most people don't know what the code is. It's sort of hidden, and there's probably other things inside your iPhone, which if you know the secret code, you can get, but you kind of feel you should probably know some of it, and some of it will, like, again, the, 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 the cell towers you connect to is essentially location data, and that is kind of personal to you, so it's a little bit worrying. And the final one here is the, the Roomba. Do you want to talk about the Roomba or do you want me to talk about the Roomba? Feel free. I think everybody knows about the Roomba case, right? You must it have was, seen it in the press. It was a raised. thing that Just happened last it. week that was okay. a rumor announced right. that, uh, or that have been found out that there are, that their little robot that goes around vacuuming your house is actually mapping your house while it's, while it's doing that, which is always uh, mm. nice to know that someone's looking around how, how big your house is. And that, of course, has an effect on, you know, people selling properties or something, right? So you could buy this data and then use it to determine property values. Are properties getting larger or smaller in a particular region over a period of time? This kind of stuff. And so that's what we're trying to capture with data exploitation. We view the hacker community as a particularly empowered voice in this debate. I mean, there are many people in here who can reverse engineer devices. We'll show you a bit of reverse engineering of a couple different devices here in just a moment. Um, but the point is that not everyone can do that. So how do we extend that ability to run wire shark on a router and see what data is going out and then challenge the company legally, how do we extend that to a wider audience to build a, an advocacy movement that helps protect us and our data in the future? Yeah, one, sorry, one final point on the Roomba, just while we're at it. Um, I presume the people who bought the Roomba didn't know that their house was going to be mapped. They bought it because it was a vacuum cleaner and it's mm -hmm. doing something completely separate to what was they originally thought it was going to do. And, and we could challenge that particular issue yep. in multiple ways. It's not just that they necessarily use the data in a different way. It's also that they can brick the devices, right? So everybody remember the, the Nest uh, situation where you buy a Nest and you're able to use it for home automation, and then they threaten to brick it because the project has been shut down. So it used to be when you bought a dishwasher, it continued to work, and uh, it wouldn't be shut down or altered, or the data wouldn't be used remotely in some other way. Um, that's something that's changing, and we'll talk about some of our approaches to solving that. Cool. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of a, a spiel about <laughs> cars. And uh, this is a, uh, before I get too into it, the, uh, this is from the 
2017 Nissan Qashqai's handbook on their, their connected app and their connected car. And I just love this one because of all the, uh, the, the surrounding stock imagery. Like, what has this got to do with cars? <laughs> it's great. But um, yeah, this, uh, so their car is a, a, is a really interesting one in the, that it has integrated like Facebook and TripAdvisor. And this is, um, you know, this is becoming more and more common, obviously, because people want to social network on the go, I think. I don't, I don't know. I'm not a social networker. But anyway. Well, I heard that. I heard that from the car companies. I went to a, a conference with Daimler, and they said that there's a large block of people on the west coast of the USA that buy cars and literally say things like, I don't want to have social death when I get in my car. I want to be able to tweet. I want to be on Facebook. I want to be able to share my location with my partner as I travel around so they know what time I'll be home. So that, that seems to be a bit of a market force for them. Um, and they now offer a service to delete all the data from your car, uh, from their particular models of the car, yeah. but no one uses it, right? So when you sell your car, you could delete all of this data, but a lot of people never take advantage of that service. And plenty of companies, as far as I know, don't even offer that service. Well, yeah, we've, uh, we've seen cars also, like, <laughs> the deletion is a real issue in cars because often they just refer to it as factory reset, which doesn't necessarily delete, it just makes it null, as, you know, there's no, you know, there was no data there. Um, you know, the, and then sometimes the factory reset, uh, reset is functionally a fact that you have to take it to a dealer who is authorized to reset the car. It's not a. It's not just. Yeah, it's a, a real pain in the ass. But yeah, the, the 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 side effect of this is that this car is now having Facebook data or TripAdvisor data or Google data on it, and it's probably not the most secure environment for that data. Um, it can, it, well, yeah, we'll talk about it in just a minute, so. Sure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just a, a brief guide for people who aren't particularly fair with reverse engineering or what it is. It's basically taking stuff apart and seeing what's inside it. Um, it's all, like, it's quite indicative. Like, you can look up all the chips and have a look at what the chips do. If you're happy to do some testing, you can do some testing between the interconnects, see what they connect to. Um, and it can show whether a device is secure or insecure in some respects. So, yeah, cool. I'll probably talk a lot about reverse engineering, you know, one yeah. way or another. So, on my desk back in my office, I've got uh, loads of bits of car. It's quite, it's quite the intrigue. <laughs> um, and at the moment, I've been looking at uh, two BMW telematics units from one series, and I've got two... Range Rover telematics units, one's from a 2016 Evoque, and the other one's from a 2013 Freelander. Uh, you know, pr quite premium cars, all of them. And it's, it's, they're fascinating with how much crap they have on them, basically. Uh, so, let, yeah, let's have a quick look at them, shall we? Sure. So this is the uh, this is the Land Rover. Well, Jaguar Land Rover. They're the same company. So, or at least when these were made, they were the same company. I think Jaguar is now owned by Tata. I'm not sure if Land Rover was also bought by Tata. Uh, and a few of you might be like, well, you know, it looks it looks like a computer, and it it is. So essentially, it is a computer, and it's in your car. Except this computer uh, uses a a system called so. There's a, a sock on here, this is this Renesis sock. Um, and one of the features of this sock is that it's for automotive use, and it's got a, a bus on it called the CAN bus. And the CAN bus is connected to everything else, and the CAN bus isn't encrypted or anything. You can send any arbitrary data across that CAN bus, including, uh, so this, is, this CAN bus is connected to a 3G modem, so that's nice, that's cellular. Uh, it's also connected to its own Ethernet control. The car has its own uh, Ethernet network because you know you want that in your car. Yeah. Why not? Uh, it's got a, a Wi-Fi chip because you know if you can't get on hardwired, you might as well get on Wi-Fi. Uh, the whole th the whole unit doesn't turn off with the car. It stays on all the time because you know it could be collecting data, and it's got quite a lot of storage for mm. for an embedded system. This has got this one I think has a you know, about three hundred. 400 meg of storage on it, which is quite a lot. Um, if you look in the handbook, some of that storage is used by its um, emergency recovery system, which is basically a black box. Um, in the same way you have flight recorders in planes, you have a flight recorder in your car that 
checks to see why an airbag was deployed, but it also checks to see maybe whether you are driving quite aggressively. You know, heavy acceleration, heavy braking, that's all logged. And although this is currently not connected to an insurer, I'm sure an insurer would find that information very interesting. <laughs> there, there actually, there was an insurer in the States who wanted to plug USB devices into cars to keep track of your driving. And then depending on your driving over the course of a month or two, they would offer you a lower price uh, on your insurance. Um, but then another friend of mine went and did some reverse engineering of that USB and found that he could uh, load it with the exploits. So they were actually changing the attack surface of the car at the same time that they're trying to offer you better insurance, which is uh, kind of a crazy, crazy life oh, cycle. Yeah, yes. Have um, you, as I said curiosity. about this uh, Renesis chip is that it is also got, it's got USB 3, obviously. Why yeah. wouldn't you want a USB 3 in your car? And obviously. It's got, and it's got, um, you know, full, full video out. So it's, it is essentially a computer in your car. So just out of curiosity, have you uh, sent like an eighth uh, plus plus zero over the CAN bus just to see if it disconnects the modem? No, I haven't. No, Sorry. No. <laughs> I guess that's a bit old school. Huh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you wanted to say about this? Uh, Does no. anybody know what the unknown test points down, uh, down at the bottom are? Any other car hackers here? Any car hackers here? I know they're here at the camp, but all right. Anyways. OK. Cool. Do you want to go look at the next one? I think one of the important points is Chris has been working on this for like two years. So having each individual person kind of do this and protect their own data and try and understand all of this stuff is kind of untenable. So what we're hoping to do is make sure that this kind of research eventually makes it to the public so it can be used for legal advocacy. So you can go to the companies and get back the data that we know they're gathering. Yeah, because like I can only do one car every now and again when I've got, other, when I've got time to. And there's just thousands of models of cars. And most of the systems are proprietary. So, and it's pretty low hanging fruit. It's literally opening the thing up and having a look inside and just working out what all the chips are and hopefully how they connect. But not even that, just what they are even is, is you know, very helpful. We also want to change the debate a little bit. There's nothing wrong with the stunt hacking that's been going on for safety reasons. It's you know, fantastic research, shows us what we should be concerned about. But there's precious few people doing this for privacy reasons as well. And I think that uh, both of those things need to be done at the same time. Cool. Your slide. Do you want to skip through a couple of the animations? <laughs> Sorry. Right. Yeah. So this is, a, this is the BMW's unit. Um, and you know, keep going. Which is a, a nice, and I got this. This is a good one because um, the FCC, uh, the American version of this unit, uh, has to go through FCC regulation. So I actually get a nice block diagram if you go forward another slide, which is great. And uh, I wonder if anyone recognizes any of those chips in that block diagram. Anyone? That is uh, an iPhone 4, effectively. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, this is in the BMW, and it's essentially it's the same power chip and same modem as in an iPhone 4, and it's connected to the Samsung memory, which is also in an iPhone 4. So it <laughs> you've basically got an iPhone in your car without even, you know, without even knowing about it. Um, yeah, so this, this extension board, this daughter board, connects to this, uh, this slot in the bottom corner here. Uh, and it, uh, this one the, one, the model of the car I had was probably a low spec one, unfortunately, because the, the empty solder contacts are for GPS, but again, all of it's just aggregated in one chip, you know, passed around the canvas. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great, and uh, yeah, it's quite, quite uh, privacy, low, low, low on the privacy scale. Right. <laughs> cool. So we talked like about looking in cars, hacking cars a little bit, maybe. Yeah, tell them the fun stuff we got to do last week. Yeah, OK. So we've done a little bit of it. We've, we've recently started having a look at rental cars, because rental cars are a really interesting example of data exploitation. So when you buy a car and you put data on it, it's kind of your car, your data. It's, you, know, you're, you have some control over it. When you rent a car, you know, you only got it for a couple of days, and you put, you know, your location data in it, or you put your, um, pho you know, you connect your phone to the car, and you, you know, you do a, a call through or whatever. And it's, you know, as soon as you give the car back, if you don't wipe that data, no one wipes that data. Well, at least that's how we think. No one wipes that data. So you have, you know, just personal information of loads of people just driving around. Mm. And we're kind of hoping whether you guys might be able to give us a hand with this. So 
We're looking for anyone who is uh, looking to rent cars in Europe, particularly in Europe, because we are a UK charity. And although the UK is still part of Europe, it's not seen as being the, <laughs> the most yes. European of countries. Yes, it is. Um, so yeah, if, you were in, if you're in Europe and you're renting a car, please can you get in contact with me because I'd like to talk to you about it. Mm. Yeah, some of the things we found is that as soon as you collect your, connect your phone to the car, all of your missed calls or made calls or whatever are suddenly available to people, even if you've walked away from the car a certain distance. Um, some of the places that you've been in the past are, are there stored in the car. And of course, theoretically, you can delete all this, but the user has to know to delete all this. And we sat down and read through all of the license agreements on this particular vehicle that we were looking at, and it took us an hour just scrolling through the menus to read all of the license agreements and understand all of the software that was in the car that we were renting for a day. So um, it's kind of an untenable position in the long run for users. All right, we're going to change gear a little bit, pun intended. No, nice pun. Thanks. Um, I practiced that. Um, so yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit about IoT, uh, a little bit about Mirai, and then we'll move on to medical data. And it's going to go a little bit quickly. This is from a paper uh, by an academic uh, and his students at the University of Cambridge. And what they were trying to do is map vulnerabilities over time. And I think it's a great graph, because it's sort of what I had in my head as a pen tester when I was at IOActive. You have, this is just known vulnerabilities. So this, we're not talking about zero days or you know, something new. This is just, do we know if a vulnerability exists or not in this particular version of this particular phone on this particular network? So different phone networks send you updates and patches for your phone or for the apps at different ratios. And this is basically showing you that at any given time for Android, uh, there's always some exploits left that we know about, or some vulnerabilities, if not exploits, um, that are available to us as attackers. So the patching rate on the phones is just not high enough to maintain a some assured level of security. And I think it's a fantastic graph that illustrates that. So you can go and see some of their work uh, on Android. They have a product called Device Analyzer where they gather this data with people's consent. I also want to talk to you a little bit about Mirai. And uh, did you want to say something about Tesla before we move on? No, I'm all okay. right. Next one. So this is going to go a little bit quickly. Um, lots of people have heard of Mirai, right? You know about the Mirai case. I like to use it as an example of pollution. Go on, um, give, go on give them a quick introduction. Okay, so Mirai was, a, Mirai was a botnet used primarily for DDoS, uh, as far as we can tell. Um, and essentially, it was infecting uh, IP cameras, uh, CCTV cameras, uh, digital recorders, set-top boxes, these kinds of things, right? Um, and then it was using those devices to perform DDoSes around the world. So essentially, some vendor comes along and sells you a product, and it does something that you don't think about that's poorly configured DNS or um, SNMP or something. And then that can be used, in turn, to perform DDoS attacks on other people, either because it gets exploited or because it's a reflector of those protocols, right? Yeah, so fun functionally, Mirai's problem was that it was default passwords. Yes. So essentially, yeah, we're uh, talking about admin admin, right? Um, so there's some discussion we can have about uh, vulnerabilities and liability in a, in a moment or two. But this is uh, counts of Mirai infections by country. Um, and I know many of the people who are working these individual incidents at any given time. This is an IPv4 map, which is actually kind of horribly difficult to really read. My apologies. Um, uh, but it shows roughly the source and uh, destination addresses, uh, not for the DDoS, but, but in general for the traffic. So we'll move on. Um, this is what a Mirai Bloom looks like. So this is what inc incident responders essentially have to deal with. So here you have the countries uh, with the counts at different time over, what, a six-week period. So you can see, you know, Brazil wasn't doing too badly, and then suddenly they had a spike in infections, and then they worked very hard to clean them up, and it got a little bit better. Um, but that's what it looks like for incident responders over the course of a few weeks, constantly trying to deal with thousands of these things because companies have plenty of reasons to sell you default passwords for usability, right? Um, so next slide. All right, so here's my crazy subversive idea. Has anyone heard of the General Product Liability Directive here in Europe? Yay, thank you. Have you read it? OK, good. So uh, these two are particularly interesting to me. Um, we've been having some discussions inside the computer security community about whether or not the product liability directive could be used if someone is hacked and the device uh, stops working in a functional sense. So we need to talk about IoT devices rather than, say, everyday general purpose computing. Could someone sue them 
<laughs> because the product is no longer working. So it used to be if you had a dishwasher and it floods your kitchen, you can sue them because it floods your kitchen, right? Well, what happens if someone SID floods the dishwasher and the dishwasher floods your kitchen? Can you still sue them? So there's some discussions going on in Europe about whether or not this is a good idea and whether or not it's possible. So we looked into the product liability directive, and it says quite clearly <clears throat> that the EULA does not prevent liability for an IoT device manufacturer. So the liability of the producer arising from this direct directive may not, rela in relation to the injured person, be limited or excluded by a provision limiting liability and exempting from liability. So the end user license agreement would be violating Article 12, essentially, is what we're talking about. The other thing that's important is in one of these two clauses, I believe it's in number one, uh, the liability of the producer shall not be reduced when the damage is caused by both a defect in the product, i.e. a vulnerability, and by the act or omission of a third party, a hacker. So we're exploring whether or not liability could be divided up between manufacturer and attackers, and whether or not this would have a f an effect on uh, the quality of products in the future. So let's move on. This is a modern um, an example of computers in medical rooms, right? In hospitals, in surgeries, in various devices. Um, this slide was produced by a fantastic researcher called Harold Thimbleby, who's been doing medical device research for a number of years. And I think it just gets the point across, right? That these computers are everywhere, and they're used in life-critical situations that have a real-world effect, right? Um, it might be drug infusion pumps, it might be implanted uh, medical devices such as pacemakers, uh, in, you know, um, defibrillators, it can also be um, for a variety of other reasons, right? So, yeah, just getting the point across, there's quite a lot of computers here. So Harold Thimbleby's work focuses on user interface errors. This is not just about vulnerabilities, it's also about accidents. So this is a variety of different uh, ways that you can administer drugs to patients. And what I want you to, want to focus on is look at all of these user interfaces. Some of them signify 1,000 units with a comma, some with a full stop. Some of them place the buttons in different uh, positions, so the, the one is at the top or it's at the bottom. So your average nurse or doctor working with all of these tools has to switch between one or another and understand all the different user interfaces. This is what liability did for us 100 years ago. It standardized the car, so you don't just have a steering column on this side or this side or the middle, and you don't switch the brake pedals around with the, with the gas pedal. You standardize the user interface until things become safer. We still haven't done that in medical devices. And Harold Thimbleby estimates that, at least in the UK, the number of deaths related to medical device user interface errors is equivalent to the number of deaths from car crashes. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. Um, one of the points I want to make here is that one in 1,000 of you in Europe will end up with an implanted medical device sometime in your lifetime. In Norway, for example, that's getting close to about one in 200. So as we all get older and we have implanted medical devices or even wearables, this is going to be very important to us. And medical implants have recently been used for forensics and led to convictions, right? The medical insurance industry wants this data to keep track of your health over time and change the pricing of your insurance. My concern is that you won't know why the price of your insurance changed because they'll have gotten the data from some second company or third company. And lastly, you shouldn't have to choose between health and privacy. So we have a special guest speaker here with us that we've been tweeting about and joking about for a while. I don't know if many of you know uh, Dr. Marie Mua, but she's here with us today. And I'd like to invite her up on the stage to tell you a little story of her own. So would you please give her a nice round of applause for joining us. Cool. Thanks. So I have a pacemaker implanted in my body. I have a computer inside of me. I got it five and a half years ago. And at the time I was working at Norwegian CERT doing incident response, already working on information security. And I suddenly needed this device to stay alive. So I'm depending on a computer inside. Uh, it, I have data inside of me in this computer generated by my own body and I can't get access to it. It's all proprietary information. Uh, this, com this computer also sends out log information. Uh, you can hook it up to kind of medical Internet of Things, um, and there are websites where the doctors can log in and see my, my patient data. But this is not available to me as uh, the generator of this data. 
So I started a um, pacemaker hacking project together with Erin um, to see if I could get access to some more information um, about my pacemaker and my data, and if I could actually trust this device that is keeping me alive. Um, I've been doing some talks about it. Um, a little less than a year ago, I was invited to do a keynote talk for hardware.io. Some of you might have been there. It's a great conference on hardware hacking here in the Netherlands. Uh, and I actually ended up in hospital uh, in Amsterdam. So this is me in the hospital because my pacemaker failed while I was up in the air in the airplane on my way to give that talk. Um, so this is a kind of a personal story about my own critical infrastructure and how I accidentally ended up getting hold of some information due to this happening. So I was up in the airplane, my, my business just, usually I don't feel anything, I don't feel the pacing from the pacemaker, even though it's working 100% of the time and just keeping my heart beating. But suddenly I just get a strange sensation. I could feel that something was going on. I looked down at my chest, I could see my chest muscle was twitching. And so I, I figured out there's something wrong with the pacemaker. I notified the air crew. When we landed at Schiphol, there was an ambulance waiting for me that took me directly to the hospital. I had to spend the night there because I didn't have a pacemaker technician in at the time. And this is me the morning after, um, when they roll in the table with the pacemaker programmers. So you can see for different brands of programmers, they have to use the programmer that is actually connected to, that, that is from the same manufacturer as my device because all the wireless communication protocols are all proprietary, uh, so they don't work, uh, uh, there's no like, in, uh, open standards for this. So you have to have the correct programmer to the correct device. Um, but I'm looking happy in this picture. That's because I found out that it's, not, it's actually something that can be fixed um, by just giving me a software update. <laughs> <laughs> or a firmware update. <laughs> Uh, so, so I didn't have to have any surgery. There was nothing like physical, like there was not, not a hardware issue with my pacemaker. Um, so this is uh, the face of the pacemaker technician uh, when he had hooked me up to the programmer. He was looking at the display, display on the programmer and he saw this error message. Next slide. So this was actually had been going wrong, there was a data error in the pacemaker. It was, uh, it had switched up the uh, uh, voltage. That's why I felt the pacing. It was constantly pacing me 70 beats per minute. And I'm really happy that they had engineered in this safety feature because that was actually keeping me alive. Uh, it was a bit uncomfortable, but not, not a crisis. Um, but check this out. Um, there's actually a memory dump and a log file created on the pacemaker programmer um, because of this crash. So I'm sitting there getting a firmware update, and after that, uh, I'm uh, good to go after we have configured the device, of course. Um, I happened to uh, have a memory stick in my bag, as you usually have when you travel, and I asked, that the, uh, I asked if, the, uh, if I could get a copy of this file, and that way I actually ended up getting hold of some log data from my pacemaker that we've been trying to get hold of uh, also in the hacking project, so that was a win. Um, I also reached out to the manufacturer and I also got some of that data from them, uh, which made me get access to memory dump from my device. So this is what you have to do to get hold of your patient information if you're wearing proprietary uh, computers inside yeah, you need to hack it or you need to get a you know, failure event and get hold of the logs. You're so. the only person I know who's willing to have a uh, heart failure to social engineer a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> okay, so you can move on to your conclusions. Okay, I think all right. we're running out of time. Um, we are. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully that gives you a sense of uh, some of what we're dealing with. Obviously, we can talk about safety, um, but we also want to talk about privacy. 
So um, we're trying to formulate these data exploitation principles. One of the things we want to do is reduce data monopolies in general. Of course, that's very, very difficult in a corporate world. But there are ways that we can do that. Um, and we would like to work with some regulators, if there's any regulators in the room, to work on some of those issues. Um, we also want to address the imbalance of power between user and company. So you shouldn't have to spend two years hanging out at hacker camps just to be able to access your own medical data. I mean, I know you probably would have done that anyway. But uh, the point still stands, right? That it takes a lot of time and effort to do this. Um, we also want to legally contest the non-consensual data sharing that we see a lot of the time, um, such as Chris uh, tweeting pictures from the stage. Yeah, sorry. No, I'm just joking. It's fine. <laughs> um, so we use a variety of these different techniques down at the bottom. Uh, DSARS. So Chris built a nice little router uh, to collect data from any particular mm -hmm. IoT product that we bring into the office. And it's basically just Wireshark on a router, right? But every time we buy a new device, we run it in the office, and we bootstrap it, and we see which data it's kind of sending across. And this means we can make legal requests to the companies, and we know in advance what data they will have. So we're in a position to say, we want you to give us this data. And then when they say, we don't have it, we can say, we know you do, because here's the Wireshark, right? Yeah. Um, so a simple approach, but uh, please join us in this kind of thing. Uh, we also work on multilateral uh, international uh, sharing agreements yeah. and try and challenge those. Freedom of information requests and amicus briefs, as we yeah. said previously. FOI is a great tool. The yes. FOIs are a fantastic tool. Lots of people have filed an FOI in here, right? Really? Only a few? File more FOIs. Just, just yeah. Get it. Use, use camp bandwidth for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, we're going to try and wrap it up. Yeah, I'll try and keep this one short. That's OK. Yeah, we'll do our best. So we've talked about the problem. So PI is trying to work on what might be the solution. And what we're trying to do is bring like a, a set of principles that are like the, the, you know, the, the, the entry level of what users should expect from you know, when devices or services they use, and uh, you know, it's like the, you know, what you, what you would want, like a, a baseline, effectively. So, you know, and there's about 14 of these, so I'm going to try and whiz through them reasonably quickly. I'm looking for comment on them, uh, or we're looking for comment on them, to be honest. Um, I'd prefer if you would send me comment rather than do it in the uh, questions at the end. That'd be great, because I'd like to keep a note of your comments, but. I'll try and go through these as quick as I can. So first thing about, so this is with the, it's brought into two, two categories. There's data and control and uh, security of information. And so the data and control stuff is uh, stuff like all, all the data that is derived from your personal data should be treated the same as your personal data. Like That seems fairly sen sensible, really. Um, systems should be designed to minimize data uh, yeah, data generation, processing, and access. And that's very important. A lot of people focus on minimizing the processing, but they gather far more data than they need to. And as you start to look at these devices, you see that. Yep. Um, the data should not be generated, collected, analyzed, retained, or transmitted aggressively or excessively. And although excessively is a bit of a vague way of putting this, it's maybe excess in relates to the user rather than the, the you know, some arbitrary number, excessive, like, were you expecting that to happen, basically? Um, the uh, general data protection principle anyway, data must be protected from access by people who aren't the user. That's already mostly in U European data protection law, but again, we've talked about places where there is no data protection law. Mm -hmm. um, of individuals must be able to ascertain their digital footprint. They must know, you must be able to find out how much data you've got. So you have DSARS, but that doesn't actually really necessarily tell you much. That tells you maybe what you've told a company, but it doesn't necessarily tell you the data that's been interpreted from your data. It doesn't tell you, you know, all sorts of types of data that your data it, could be used for. In fact, for. I don't think we have legal instruments to determine what can be derived from your data or what AI could derive from your data or what data fusion could be performed. We have legal instruments for the individual, but not necessarily for society in general. So we see this as kind of a consumer rights issue. Um, individuals must be able to uh, delete and refresh their data. Like you must have the option. It's bit like the the GDPR does change this a bit because previously, in, well, at least in the UK, you could ask if data to be amended, but not necessarily deleted. Whereas in the GDPR, you can now ask for data deletion. But uh, we think it should just be a general principle anyway. Um, and if you're if you want to, you should be able to have a negotiable 
uh, identity and at default you should be anonymous. You shouldn't have to give data to user service if that data isn't intrinsic to the operation of that service. Cool. Do you want to go on to the next one? So this is more uh, relating to the uh, security and protection side of things. Um, and the first one is um, devices shouldn't be able to betray us. Our devices and services should not be able to betray us, which is, again, it's, it's sort of wrapped into the one we've already gone over, but it's, uh, you know, your, your device shouldn't be giving out data, uh, like, personal information about you um, without your knowledge or consent or whatever. So an example of this would be something like Wi-Fi, which broadcasts all the previous SSIDs you've been on. It's betraying a load about your you know your previous connectivity like it would if your ssid is named whatever you work the company you work for and your at home ssid is where, named where you live or whatever it's telling an awful lot about you by just broadcasting and it's sort of betraying you mm. um individuals should have insight into the data that's collected on them and, and why and through and how you know we've talked about pacemakers we've talked about cars you need to know What's the point? Why? Why did someone take this off me? <laughs> right. You buy a set-top television box and you expect to be able to download content. You don't necessarily think about the fact that it's keeping track of all the content you watch to give you better content for values of better. Uh, security updates should be separate and distinguishable from uh, feature updates. That's this is the Microsoft problem, I think. Silent upgrades. Yes. Yep. Uh, this is where you get new features you don't necessarily want because you also want to have the security features, which you do want. They should be two separate things. Um, manufacturers, well, we talked about liability already, but manufacturers maybe should be responsible for security of their device throughout their life cycle? Um, yeah. Sorry. yeah, absolutely. And all entities that handle a user's data should be joint and severally liable for it. Mm. So, as again, this is... This is in some data protection law, but not all data protection law. And it would be great that if this were like the, the baselines of, mm. yeah. So if you're willing to do some activism around this and you want to do some legal activism or some technical activism or just be an empowered user, if you have some ideas about our data exploitation principles, how we can explain them to everyday people who are not hackers, who are very empowered and have a voice, um, please uh, get in touch and let us know. Chris won't be here uh, because he's going to run away back to yes. London as quickly as possible. <laughs> Marie and I will both be here, but Marie doesn't work for Privacy Inf International, so bring the questions uh, about PI to me. Of course, you can speak to her about medical devices and so on. Um, and thank you very much for your time. You could have gone anywhere and seen any talk, so thank you for coming to see our talk. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. Oh. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. And now we still have uh, about 15 minutes for an open discussion. Escape. Escape. So if any one of you has a question, please go to the microphones at the center of the tent. You, you don't have to answer my question, but uh, the Prime Minister of, of the United Kingdom, Mrs. May, has a very peculiar track record. Mm. Can, can you get closer to the mic, please? Can you comment on, on the track record of her government and mm. will it be replaced soon, I hope? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as a, as a representative of Privacy International, I don't think I can advocate uh, mm -hmm. any non-democratic process uh, in any way. Um, but the future of the UK's uh, approach to surveillance, I hope, will change. And we'll continue to challenge that. So as we said at the outset, our amazing legal team, who I started to work with, challenged the UK's collection of data, uh, data retention laws, and also the sharing of data internationally, and won that court case so that GCHQ had to acknowledge that they had gathered that data for 17 years illegally. Um, and that's the sort of work that we'll continue to do. So I hope that that, uh, regardless of any individual politician, whatever party they might come from, we, we don't like to see that kind of data retention continue, and we'll try and challenge it anywhere in the world that we can. Next question, please. Yes, um, a comment and, and a question. Uh, I really like your work about cars. Um, just to give you an idea of how bad security is with car companies, um, my job is normally, I'm a policy expert, I work for the OECD in Paris, I used to work for the Ministry of Economic Affairs in the Netherlands, I don't code at all. Mm -hmm. 
um, I hack law, I basically say. I did hack Toyota. Mm -hmm. Toyota the Netherlands, I hacked their website and I was able to get access to the data of uh, other Toyotas just by entering the uh, number plate. Right. Yeah. And I could see what people had uh, downloaded for their car, what kind of software updates, and I could also send updates to their navigation system if they actually use that f um, uh, function. Um, that was completely not secured whatsoever. That I can hack that is a testament to how bad it, it is. Yeah. Absolutely. I know Valisek and Miller, who did fantastic work on car hacking, uh, also discovered the same thing. Once they got onto the network of the ISP or the, the mobile phone provider, uh, they could see multiple different vehicles identified by their vehicle in, uh, identification number, the VIN. Yeah. Um, and so they could see many vehicles at the same time. So yeah. I mean, maybe yeah. Chris wants to say some more about that. Yeah, I got two points there. So firstly, talking about Toyota anecdotes, it was Toyota, he said. Mm -hmm. um, so me and uh, my dad and I both own Toyotas. And uh, we both live at the same, well, we were both living at the same address. So we registered our car on whatever it is, mytoyota.eu. And I could yeah, see that site. And I could see all of his car details and all the stuff about his car. And I could see all of my car. And he could see all of my car. It did, yeah, it's yeah. Not a, it wasn't a great system. Uh, so I reported it. Um, they said, thank you. They gave yep. me five tickets to the Toyota Laumann Museum, uh, which is a brilliant car museum here in the Netherlands. So <laughs> thank you. But I don't think anything has properly changed at yep. the site. No, I, I totally agree with you. I've, I think um, the same thing. I also reported it. <laughs> good. Um, so, so at least we, we did our due diligence on that. Um, I, I do have a common... Um, I'm running around with this idea on a policy side that... Um, Notifying and making people accept end-user license agreements is just idiotic and, and our privacy rules want us to register all the data that we have on a, on a person to see whether it's privacy sensitive, but data is collected everywhere. My standard example is that even street lights, connected street lights could these days be privacy sensitive because if you walk out at night from your home and make a trip through your neighborhood and the lights turn on, that could be recorded, and then yep. you could see at night who went out of their house at what time. Yep. So instead of forcing people to register all the data that they, that, that they collect, it would be much better if we could get people to tell you who accessed your data. The same with, with medical data, etc. In the Netherlands, you need to give an upfront access to, to your data to a particular person before they can access it. Um, but that prohibits doctors when you're lying half dead on the ground to access your medical data, which is right. a problem for the ambulance staff. So it would be much better if we had a register of who access data on you mm. yep. than that we try to block it up front. What's your idea on that? It sounds like uh, that's probably a wider conversation we could have together with PI and, uh, and yourself. Um, there's lots of regulatory approaches that we are talking about taking. The main thing is just focusing on the empowerment of the user. But I realize it's also becoming untenable for, for companies uh, to be able to manage all this data and access in the ways that they're talking about. So it's a problem that society needs to yep. solve in general. Um, and that's why we like to work with lawmakers and regulators and lawyers and hackers and human rights researchers. Uh, we think it's a really multidisciplinary approach that changes things over time. Yeah, the, the data sharing is a big issue anyway because it's often non-negotiable. Like, you agree to the, like, although we'll argue that uh, license agreements and um, e EULAs are functionally useless, but you're, <laughs> you're, uh, you have to agree to these terms if you want to use a product or service, and you're having to share data which you, with people you might not even want to share data with, so it's... Yeah. Or, or you might want to do it now. I, I'm going to later. cut you there yeah. because there's other people joining yeah. the conversation. Find me a little bit later in the No, so you still have yeah. time. No, no, I just yes, mean okay. we'll have a chat again later. Please go. I have a question to Mary. Uh, probably your device was hit by a stray cosmic particle. Are you trying technical countermeasures now when flying, like putting a sheet of metal over your <laughs> pacemaker? It's a really rare event, uh, but I fly a lot, so I guess uh, if it's happening to someone, then it would happen to me. Uh, so it's uh, possibly, or most likely, it was caused by uh, cosmic radiation, and uh, that caused bit flips in the memory of the device. Um, I don't think I want to uh, 
like I, I can't live my life uh, worrying about my device not working all the time. Actually, I feel better after having this incident because of the fail-safe mode, failure mode made me stay alive. So mm. uh, uh, it actually worked, uh, mm. even though this happened. Um, and I don't want to go around with a uh, Faraday cage uh, <laughs> to protect myself against uh, that. <laughs> yeah, your <laughs> husband uh, might object. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Any more questions? Well, I have one, and okay. not everyone here is a very experienced hacker that knows how to track their internet. And I was missing the part of the tutorial where you tell people, like, which is the easy access software that people can install so that they can like track what their devices are doing, all their connected yeah. devices. I think for an everyday user, it's not that there's so many tools. So so as a reasonably technical hacker person, you use Wireshark, right? Uh, you download a tool called Wireshark, and it keeps track of all the connections that are made uh, over the internet on a particular interface. And so then you can record that, almost like you would record a phone call, and then you can decode it with various tools. And there's many workshops here on Wireshark uh, at the camp, some of them del delivered by people who really know the software, have been writing it for years. There's also little tools like Little, uh, little Flocker, um, which keeps track of web browser. Uh, interactivity, so it doesn't keep track of all interactivity, but at least the web browser. So some of those tools, I would say, uh, get people started. Um, and then maybe some of you in the audience will write some next-gen tools that are easier to use than Wireshark uh, for capturing this kind of thing. Um, PI is also working on a, a, a nice segue here. I'm working on a uh, another project. My uh, my my other colleague in the uh, tech team in uh, PI is uh, writing a bit of software he calls Thornsec. Mm which uh, is basically uh, compartmentalization for networks and is about trying to minimize the amount of cross-contamination and cross-communication anyway. It's not so much about the logging so much, but it is trying to minimize what things are talking to what. Mm. So shout out to Ed. Yeah. <laughs> I recognize I also work with a team of lawyers. Uh, so I Can you get closer to oh, the mic, sorry. please? Thank you. Uh, Cool. Um, so I also work with a team of lawyers. Closer, uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, the team of lawyers I work with, they said that uh, pseudonymizing the data uh, with the current GDPR, mm -hmm. it is uh, pseudo the pseudonymized data holds the same regulations as uh, not pseudonymized, so really mm -hmm. nominized data. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your reflection on that? How, what, what do you... It's, uh, it depends a little bit on the data itself, but in general, uh, there are ways to de-anonymize data again using mathematical techniques. And as a broad stroke, this isn't true for everything, I think that the legal boundary is not sufficient against uh, a mathematical or hacker boundary. Let me say that differently. I think the state of the art in the mathematical uh, anonymity community is far beyond what the law is protecting us from at the moment. And if any laws don't sort of keep up with the offensive community, then we fall behind, and it becomes sort of meaningless uh, legislation in some way. Yeah. It, it helps, but it's not enough. No. Necessary, but insufficient. That's my answer. <laughs> I have two questions for Marie. Um, the first one is about the um, other users of the um, pacemaker. Do they also have access to their data? Or are you the only person in the whole world <laughs> who's got the data from your um, pacemaker? It depends on what kind of data uh, you're talking about. So uh, the data that is related to the configuration settings of the pacemaker, you can get ac access to if you have a programmer. And that's typically when you go into checkups that they, they, they can set this configuration. And I always ask for a printout a hard copy of all my configuration settings. And that came in really handy when I had this incident because I was in hospital in Amsterdam and needed to get my device reconfigured. And since I had access to, uh, I had this printout, it was actually in my office back home, so I had to call a colleague and uh, get him to scan it for me and send it to me on email. We were able to configure and tune the device exactly as it was before this happened. So I could just walk out of there and, and be as normal again. Uh, because it was impossible to get hold of this information, this data from my local hospital in Norway when I was in, in the Netherlands. So really happy that I had this data. Um, also, uh, it's possible to get hold of these programmers on eBay. Uh, so I bought a programmer uh, for $500. 
And it came with a lot of data uh, that you, I could get access to, uh, which is kind of a privacy uh, violation of uh, the patients that had their data in this uh, programmer that wasn't really decommissioned properly before it was sold on eBay. Uh, so it's possible to get hold of this data. Uh, but the kind of data that we got from, from the uh, crash file, that's the kind of data that's only the manufacturer that will uh, usually uh, have access to. Uh, or if you do like a forensic exam examination of, uh, of a device. Um. And then the second question I have for you is more kind of your creative imagination of the data you get. And so have you got any plan after getting the memory dump of your heart? If I've got any have you um, got a plan? plan, have you got any, um, what, what, what are you, you going to do? do with the data? With what I'd data? like to do with the data. Uh, yeah, I'd uh, like to just know more about how my device works, basically. Um, I couldn't get access to the source code running on the device or the firmware on the device uh, without hacking it. Uh, so uh, I want to, as a security researcher, uh, uh, have a, like a third-party opinion on uh, how secure uh, this uh, pacemaker is because I know uh, there's a lot of uh, pacemakers that have been shown to not be uh, secure that haven't uh, really implemented uh, uh, security protocols properly, um, like really failed with the, uh, with the uh, implementation of crypto, for instance. Um, I studied crypto. And I get upset uh, when I hear that uh, some pay pacemakers uh, have uh, authentication kind of implemented by a 24-bit key. <laughs> so it's a kind of uh, silly, uh, really, uh, if you know some uh, thing about uh, crypto. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Christopher, you had an announcement? Oh, no, when, when questions are over. All right, then please join, sir. What you what you are saying is that they use the privacy argument for not giving you access to your own data and your own machine, right? Uh, well, they're using their IPR as a kind of uh, mm. um, You, you want to, to know your own information, so why should they say it's, pri it's privacy break? Yeah. That's, um, I, I think we need to move into a, a future with more transparency in how these devices actually work so that people can trust them. Chris? Any other questions? Oh, we've no. Done, done with questions. Okay. My, uh, my only takeaways are two bits of homework. So if you are renting a car, please do get in contact with me. My details are up there. Um, or talk to Aaron if afterwards. And the other one is, any comments on the principles we put, we put forward? Uh, again, either get in contact with me uh, or they will, they, will, they will be up on our website, so you can have a look at them there if you want to see them in full. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Thank you very much. A big applause.